And then I came to another chapter, and this is the chapter that really shattered my Mormon faith. Um, because James White dealt with the Egyptian writings in the Pearl of Great Price. And see, at the time of Joseph Smith, Egyptian was basically a lost language, just starting to be relearned at the time, because the Rosetta Stone was just found like in the early 1800s. And through that stone, we were eventually able to relearn the Egyptian language, because it had the same message wrote in Egyptian and a couple of different languages which were known. And gradually over time, scholars were able to figure out exactly what Egyptian said. But Joseph Smith had free reign in the 1830s to say it meant anything he wanted to say it meant or said because nobody around him would have had a clue what Egyptian writings were saying. And what really blew me away was when he started dealing with the Egyptian writings on page 41 of the Pearl of Great Price. There's, there's a picture of these human-like figures on this page, and if you look carefully at this page, figures two and figures four on this page look very obviously feminine. They look like they've got to be women. But if you read the description that Joseph Smith gives of figures 2 and 4, I think he calls figure 2 King Pharaoh and figure 4 Prince of Pharaoh. You know, and so I mean he's identifying them as men. And then what James White pointed out is that these are the Egyptian goddesses Isis and Mat. And you can actually look these up in any encyclopedia, the internet, any Egyptian book, etc., which I did. <laughs> I got on the internet, I got into encyclopedias, I did some verification and some study on these Egyptian goddesses because I was blown away that Joseph Smith was identifying two very obviously female characters who are definitely Egyptian writings as men. And I thought, you know, it makes all the sense in the world that the Egyptians would be writing, drawing pictures of their own pagan gods, you know. And in doing studies of these goddesses, it's blown me away. They're very clearly the Egyptian goddess Isis and Mad, and every Egyptian scholar agrees, and, you know, every encyclopedia, anything on the internet, the only thing that wouldn't agree would be maybe a couple of really off-the-wall Mormon scholars who are trying to come up with some way to dig Joseph Smith out of this never-ending hole that he dug by putting these fraudulent claims on these pictures. Um, and then, of course, figure one on this page is the Egyptian god Osiris, and Joseph Smith identifies him as Abraham. And this, to me, just totally shattered everything about Mormonism, because at that point, I could finally say, okay, there is no other possible answer for Joseph Smith other than he was an absolute liar and an absolute total fraud. And I just thought, whoa, <laughs> okay. And... Anyway, God continued to really get a hold of my life in a lot of different ways. I found, not too long after this, I found myself throwing away every single heavy metal CD that I had owned, which I had spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars buying. I found myself throwing away nearly every single movie I had bought and owned, or music, video, etc., because God had changed my heart, and these were now trash. They were not anything that anybody should be listening to. I didn't want to sell them, because I didn't want anyone else to have anything to do with them. And went from idolizing these heavy metal rock stars to just really feeling sorry for them because they really need God, you know? Time went on. I, I finally found a, a church that, that I could go to. I started looking around. I didn't know what to believe, really. 
I, I started to read the Bible, though, and, and very much believed the Bible as I read it, because now I had a firm reason to believe what I was reading. And over and over again, I've found things that might be a little questionable in the Bible, but it always proves true. And I believe every single word in the Bible, as originally written, is totally true. Um, I do believe now, like Mormons claim to believe, I believe the Bible as far as it's translated correctly, but I believe it's been translated correctly in all kinds of different translations. But there's slight variations and a few little issues with some of the different translations. But the Bible is very much the Word of God. And God is very good. He is not a God who is hateful and vengeful toward sinners. He's not out there thinking, you know, what can I do to keep people out of heaven, which is really what the Mormon gospel is all about. The Mormon gospel is the system of laws and rules and regulations that must be followed, and then maybe God might decide to let you into heaven if you've followed them all to the very best of your ability, you know. By grace you're saved after all you can do, which totally ignores what grace is all about, you know. But the Bible teaches that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to, ever to eternal life, you know. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell, you know. He will let us go to hell if we choose to. Because man naturally doesn't want anything to do with God. We naturally don't. We naturally are enemies of God, the Bible says. Um, you know, and uh, I love verses like John 3, verse 18 and 36. They teach very clearly, you know, that whoever believes in Jesus Christ and what he did they have everlasting life, and anyone that doesn't believe in him, the wrath of God abides on them still. You know, the, the whole deal that I came to find with the God of the Bible is he is an absolutely holy and righteous and just God who absolutely will not dwell with sinners, and we all are sinners. But God himself became a man and entered into human flesh. John 1 verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. You know, by him all things were created, and without him was not anything made that was made. In verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, Jesus was God in human flesh. Um, I, I quoted Isaiah 43.10 earlier, but verse 11 goes on to say, you know, I am God, and besides me there is no Savior. You know, the Bible very clearly teaches there is only one God, and it very clearly teaches that that only one God is the only Savior also of all mankind. You know, but the Bible teaches, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, God wants us in heaven so much that all we've got to do is turn to Christ in faith. Turn to God in faith and say, God, I know I've messed up. I know I've got no shot at heaven by my wicked works, by the things I've done. You know, we can't write the things we do wrong. Only God can do that, and he did it in Jesus Christ. Because the Bible teaches that not only did Jesus die for our sins and take them out of the way, nailing them to his cross, but the Bible teaches that at the same time that our sins were laid on him, his righteousness is given to us. He's the only person ever born who lived a sinless, perfect life. And his righteousness, God 
gives to us at the same time our sins are given to him on the cross and dealt with because God is holy and just and righteous and he must punish our sins. And so I don't really know what else to say other than every person in this world is a fool to turn their backs on God. God is awesome. He is righteous. He is holy. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants us to be saved. He's done everything necessary for our salvation. All we have to do is put our faith and trust in Him, and we will be saved by His grace through our faith. <laughs> And that's my testimony. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. I, John 14, verse 6, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way. Trust him.